All right, we are live. We are live. I am from Vancouver, Canada. My name is Bruno Borges, and we are live at Microsoft JD Conf, the very first Microsoft Java, truly Java conference. Welcome, welcome everyone around the world. Thank you for registering for the conference. So you got a notification that we were going live at 8 a.m. We had a few technical issues, so we were late five minutes. But I'm Brazilian. If you know some Brazilian person, you know what that means. They will always be late. That's what we do for life. It's culture. Anyways, we have a great show for you today. Uh, it's a three-day show, so you have to stick with us this morning or this afternoon or evening for you, depending on where you are in the world. We have great speakers from the community, from the Java community. We have speakers from Microsoft as well. We have some of our own engineers. Uh, sharing what they know about Java. And uh, we have a few keynotes. We have keynotes this morning, tomorrow, and on Thursday. So I'm going to walk you through all of the logistics of this conference. So let's hit the next slide and look at the agenda for this. So I'll walk you through a few logistics and the schedule for the three days. So far, we had a minor change on day one on today. Uh, that I'll, I'm going to uh, explain what happened. Um, we also have a, the JD Conf Challenge on the Microsoft Learn platform, where you can learn new Java skills uh, and cloud skills. And um, after the conference, what happens? You know, so a few resources that you should uh, check out. So let's go ahead and look at the logistics. First, questions. If you have questions just send them over Twitter with the hashtag JDConf. If you're watching this stream on YouTube, you can also use the chat feature on YouTube and send your questions over there. We're going to be monitoring those two uh, um, uh, um, venues. Second is sessions are over um, every 30 minutes. So if you miss a session, just you know keep watching. After, um, if you're starting at like 9.15 or 10.15, at 10.30, there will be another session and so on and so forth. Keynotes will be between 8.10 and 9 a.m. Um, sessions starting at 9 a.m. all the way to the last session starting at 12.30 p.m. Between sessions, we have five minutes break. That's okay if you want to skip a session. All videos will be available on demand later. Um, and most importantly, between those sessions, we will try to have a chat with the speakers that are coming out and the next speaker coming in so we can have a, a nice interaction with them and also see some of the chat uh, questions and comments that were put there by the uh, by you watching this co very conference. Now, few perks for this conference. Free water for everyone. You want water? It's free. Just go to your kitchen or office space, whatever. What is free, truly. Cookies may be, may be available in the kitchen as well, whether it's a kitchen office or office kitchen. I don't know. I don't know the order. Or your house kitchen. Uh, just go check. If you don't have a cookie for today, go to your next closest grocery store and buy some, I guess. It's nice. It's nice to have cookies. And the nearest bathroom. No lines. Look at that. Conferences without lines in the bathroom. Just go to the bathroom very close to you. All right, so keynotes. Today, we have a keynote with Julia Lewson. Julia is Microsoft's uh, Corporate Vice President for the Developer Division, where I am work at. And we have Ishel Ruse coming and sharing a lot of insights of this unpredictable world that we live in. So check out this keynote, Microsoft's Open Source Journey and Ishel Ruse. I think those kind of fit together. It's unpredictable world, Microsoft hosting its first Java conference. How unpredictable is that? So for the schedule for today, um, we have the very first session uh, with Angie Jones, uh, Modern Java, Beyond Java 8. And then we have several other sessions from great speakers. We did have a change in the schedule right on last minute. Um, Fortunately, Chris Richardson had an issue with his power grid. The neighborhood where he lives in got had a power outage. And uh, hopefully, power will come very back soon for him so he can watch. 
but unfortunately the time does not match when the power comes back and uh we had uh to invite our great friend who is who always uh he's always available for backup situations like this andres Omre. we love him and he is ready to go and he's going to talk about building modular applications with jpms so um for wrapping up this we're gonna take a keynote tomorrow with uh, martin verberg and george adams and for the schedule on the second day lots of sessions as well we have um I'll give you a highlight here. You know, Monica Backwith, who works on the our Java engineering group, she backported OpenJDK for Windows on ARM. Check that out. That's an amazing uh, session. We also have Trisha G with Modern Java with IntelliJ. I think everybody's on IntelliJ these days, and it's great. It's a great tool. Um, we have Java 11 Journey at LinkedIn. So here's the thing: LinkedIn is transitioning their backend to Java 11. How are they doing that? What are the challenges they are facing? Those are the things that you're going to learn from that session. And we have other great speakers as well um, sharing their uh, insights. Finally, for Thursday, we have this keynote from Mala Gupta from JetBrains and Bruno Souza. Bruno is a great friend of mine, and they both can share lots of insights with you about community and about career development. So this is a great keynote for you to check out as well. And finally, Thursday schedule just to give you a glance of who are the speakers and what sessions you're gonna see. If you have not seen the schedule on the website, make sure you check that out. We have great presentations as well on Thursday. So we are ready to get started and we're gonna get started with Julia Lielsen. Julia, over to you, welcome. Well, thank you, Bruno. Um, it's a real honor to be here at our very first uh, Microsoft Java conference. So first of all, a little context on my role. Uh, and uh, I run the developer division here at Microsoft. Uh, that means that all of our compiler and runtime technologies from C Sharp, C++, Python, you know, Java today, to .NET, .NET Core, our tools, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, all of our tooling supporting Microsoft platforms such as Windows Tools and Azure, as well as a bunch of Azure COI, command line, all of the Azure SDKs, including a set of developer-facing services that we support in Azure. So that's what I do here at Microsoft. And today, I want to really introduce our journey uh, in Microsoft to really advance developers and making every developers more productive. And at Microsoft, our mission is empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So, for all of us working in developer division here, it's our mission to empower every developer and every development team. We want to enable them to pick any programming language of their choices and build any apps and services they want and deploy anywhere. Now, we understand for developers, programming language is what you use to express your ideas and creation. So we want to help you to rapidly turn your ideas into code and help you turn code into a feature, a product, or a service. Over the past decade, we have really evolved our strategy as a company. Today, we're very much focused on contributing our expertise to open source. We want to foster a strong community and to deliver world-class tools that can significantly improve developer productivity. Now, technology is a fast moving field. Uh, new paradigm, framework are constantly getting created. Today, we talk about Kubernetes, PyTorch, as something everyone already knows for a long time. But really, both of these technologies are less than five years old. We need continuous improvements to programming languages, tools, and ecosystem to meet this constant need of new technology and to meet the needs of new scenarios. There are many engineering challenges that we all need to solve. And we believe the path forward is through open collaboration with the broad communities. We also believe that Microsoft is uniquely situated to be an active partner and a leader in these language communities to help advance the state of art through direct contributions back to each language community and through world-class tooling and services. 
So today I'm going to briefly share our journey um, and some of the work we have done over the past few years to really help drive open and collaborative innovation for the various language communities. I also want to briefly share our earlier work to contribute back to the Java community. And this is definitely an area of continued learning. And we want to increase our contribution level and invest even more to help further strengthen the Java ecosystem. So I will start our um, first sort of uh, language. Um, it is one of the oldest language Microsoft supported. I believe the oldest one is basic. Uh, I want to talk about the Microsoft C and C++ compiler. I have to admit, I actually end up looking at Wikipedia to find out how old this compiler actually is. Uh, this is the compiler that today compiles Windows itself, compiles Office, SQL Server, and most of the major games like Gears of War on Windows. And over the years, we have actively started working with the ISO, the Plus Standards Committee. We're very fortunate to have Herb Stutter join us way back in 2002. Herb has been serving as the chair of the ISO C++ Standard Committee for many years. In this role, he works very closely with all of the key industry leaders in C++ to really evolve and advance C++ language standards. Most recently, Herb has also helped co-sponsor a very rigorous code of conduct for the committee. And today, we have a very broad partnership with the C++ communities. We help drove our the overall C++ 20 standards um, and help implement it two of the four largest features, uh, co-routine and modules, and contribute our implementation directly to the CLAN LV LVM code base as well. And I would say early on in our journey, um, this is like 10 years ago, we kind of fall behind, fall behind our uh, standard implementation. And that's something we have absolutely rectified. We're updating our tools constantly to be fully standards conformant and compliant. And we expect to be the first tools vendor that is fully C++ 20 conformant in you know, 2021. We also start doing a ton of development in the open to really support the entire C++ ecosystem. We open source our standard library implementation on GitHub, and we also are sponsoring the open source package manager called VC Package. Um, from our tooling effort, we're really supporting cross-platform targeting. So a developer can be using Visual Studio on Windows, but debugging Linux targets. We also uh, provide a significant support for CMake and Google Test and uh, build an awesome VS Code C++ extension. And in combination, we're serving over 3.5 million monthly active users in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. So uh, this is kind of the work we're doing for the C and C++ community. Um, the next one I want to chat about is the one probably the language people mostly associate with Microsoft is our C Sharp uh, compiler and runtime. For us, the major transformation for the .NET ecosystem happened in 2014. Uh, I still remember we had Anders Halsberg, the creation, the creator of C Sharp. Uh, he did a click a button and open source the Roslyn compiler in GitHub. Uh, during the 2014 Microsoft Build Keynote. More importantly, later that year, we decided to open source the entire .NET runtime and also make it a great cross-platform runtime and framework. And as soon as we open sourced, one of our earliest port uh, of the Mac to .NET Core was actually community contribution. We were astounded back here at Microsoft to the depth of the work that the community contributed. We have such deep appreciation for what the community has done to support us. And today, we see over 3,000 companies contributing to our .NET Core repos in GitHub. And we have already you know, uh, taken over 100,000 community contributions has been accepted. Um, and the other key thing I want to chat about is that we're really committed to the developing the open methodology. This means that we work with our entire community on the roadmap and all of our code changes happen in the public. We have the SLA to look at community feedback and to respond to pull requests. We don't want our community to feel left behind. 
We want them to be with us every step along the way. Python is a very interesting one. Um, I would say that we had a wrong start with Python and we learned a huge lesson there. Back in 2008, we attempted to implement Python on top of Ubana runtime. It was an internal project called Iron Python. The resulting implementation didn't really interact with the Python ecosystem. So we killed that project a few years later. However, we did keep the tooling support for Python that we had built in Visual Studio. Over the past few years, we have really been focusing on ramping up our overall level of investment. And it helps get a much better collaboration with the existing technical community. And we learned how to be more effective at contributing and collaborating with existing technical community. And uh, we have made tremendous strides to invest and help improve the Python experiences. And most recently, we are actively participating in the Python steering committee. We are you know, gold and um, keystone sponsors for the PSF and large Python conferences. We also provide resources like licenses and Azure credits to help new build and maintain Python. And today, compared to other corporations, Microsoft has the most number of C Python core developers working as Microsoft employees. Uh, we participate in proposing and implementing several new Python language features. Uh, we're also actively contributing to new libraries for key tool sets like PyDevD debugger. Uh, recently, we also open source a new PyWrite type checker. We took our Windows exper expertise and really took over the responsibility to help deliver a smoother Python experiences on Windows, including writing and building and maintaining Windows installers uh, and the Windows Store support. And we have made significant investment to build an awesome Python extension in Visual Studio Code. And it's one of our fastest growing extensions. And you know, overall, we have greatly improved user experiences of working with Python on Windows, on GitHub, and on Azure. And we're very happy that today we have over 2.7 million monthly active users using Visual Studio VS Code to develop Python. And in 2012, we also decided to try to release in our first ever open by default language. We have taken a lot of learnings from the previous project I talked about, how to be better at standards, how to really work in the open, and how to really embrace the ecosystem from the start. Um, and we started TypeScript much in the right path, I will say. And you know, beginning in 2014, uh, it was very obvious GitHub is the home of open source. So we put all of our, put our TypeScript project on GitHub since 2014. And GitHub is also a great um, project from that it's you know, the earliest project that we fully took the open, developing the open methodology. And we have worked actively with the JavaScript communities. Uh, it become the de facto type C solution for working with JavaScript. And today supported by all modern JavaScript frameworks. It's used by nearly 60% of JavaScript developers. And in the most recent Stack Overflow survey, it's voted second most loved language. It's also great that you know, the definitely type project is consistently in the top five of most active projects on GitHub. So we have really seen you know, the strength of TypeScript. It's used to build projects like Visual Studio Code. Uh, many of the office online properties in Microsoft is built on TypeScript. And we see really broad adoptions across all of the Silicon Valley, all of the major tech companies. So um, from that perspective, TypeScript really reinforced the value of doing the open development practice and really being open. So at this point, I've covered many of the projects that we support uh, from the lesson learned and the work we're doing in developing and improving several key languages, but Java. So let's talk a bit about our plan to invest in Java. So first of all, just like any other large enterprise, Microsoft has a really large number of critical dependencies on the Java ecosystem. This may not be known for many folks here. Java is critical to our success as company, just like any other enterprises. It really helps power some of our most critical and strategic products like LinkedIn, 
Azure, Minecraft, Yammer, um, and you know, all of our Android apps. So not surprisingly, we have thousands of developers who use Java inside Microsoft to build and maintain all of these critical services. Now, while we're still early in our journey as a company on Java, and you know, as you can see, we have only started this effort a couple of years ago, we are actively trying to find the ways to really live to our core mission statement. And we want to empower every Java developers and really help Java development teams evolve and do more. And you know, our desire is to be the active sponsor for the Java community. Uh, we can contribute to the same level to Java community, much as we have been to the other language communities. So today we are happy that, that in the last couple of years, uh, we made pretty good progress. We already employ more than 10 active members of the Java Champion program. And we're actively contributing to numerous Java conferences and user groups. And being a responsible member of a open community really means that we have to contribute back. Our, when we discover a problem, we have a new algorithm, we really want to make the overall uh, ecosystem and the tools and runtime, everything better. So in recent months, we have contributed directly to the Open JDK effort. It was great to see a acknowledgement from Oracle by our, um, you know, to acknowledge our support. We implemented ports uh, for Windows and Mac OS on ARM. We really helped uh, deliver speed up Java builds on Windows. Uh, and we have improved the garbage collector to have, uh, you know, by improving, by contributing several critical performance enhancements. And, you know, you will learn a whole lot more in this conference about how we're contributing to adopt OpenJDK and other critical things in the Java ecosystem. And we have also built a Java developer experiences in VS Code in collaboration with Red Hat. We want to make people who are writing microservices really productive using the new paradigm. Now, it's also should be not a surprise that we think about GitHub as the home of open source and absolutely the open source of Java projects as well. GitHub today has over 3.6 million hosted Java repositories on its platform. Since Microsoft joined force with GitHub, we've been working to improve the overall support and resources available to Java developers. And we offer free cloud compute cycles to support CI CD needs for any open source projects. And as you can see, there's a whole long list of top Java projects, which are taking advantage of these capabilities in GitHub, using GitHub Actions for their CI CD. Um, so, you know, we definitely welcome more open source Java projects, you know, on GitHub, taking advantage of what we have to offer. And I kind of like to also talk about, you know, our support for Java on Azure. From infrastructure as a service to pass, we have been actively working with the Java industry leaders like the Oracle, like Red Hat, like VMware to offer a broad suite of offerings to make sure that we are serving the needs of Java developers. And together with Red Hat, we're really offering the, you know, we're offering a great Java uh, JBoss EAP support. And with VMware, we have a great, you know, Azure Spring Cloud services. And by working, by developing and jointly support these services together on Azure, we're making sure that your investment with Java is absolutely preserved and enhanced on Azure. And in addition to the core Java vendors, we're also working with a broad set of partners who have the tools that are very commonly used by the Java projects, such as the, you know, the Datadog and the Elastic of the world. We are also having close partnerships with them to have the best experiences on Azure in order to make sure our Java teams and Java projects has a fantastic experience on Azure. So overall, I just like to conclude that I'm really, really excited to kick off the Java Developer Conference. We're only beginning our journey here and we're really looking to learn and partner with you and work together to build a really vibrant Java developer ecosystem. Thank you so much for joining us today. And don't forget to check all of our awesome sessions coming ahead.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia. And uh, we have a very tight schedule for this keynote. So uh, let me welcome Ishel Roos for her next keynote. Hey, Ishel, how are you? Great, Bruno. Thank you very much. Um, I see. Are you are you in Switzerland? Yes, here. You, Hello you, from Switzerland. Is it already snowing? Because you have a very white wall. Like, is it snow? No, no, no. Not just yet. We're cold, but not that cold. Okay, okay, good. Because in Canada, you can see it's not snowing yet. It's it's the fall, so everything is still yellow. You can you can you can notice that, right? So, Michelle. I don't want to waste much of our time here. Please just take it over and go on. Thank you very much, Bruno. Well, I'm very excited of participating in this conference. I mean, Java and Microsoft, wow, that's a great idea. Um, if you hear an accent, it's because I'm from Mexico. As Bruno mentioned, I live in Switzerland. I'm a Java champion, a uh, software developer by trade. But sometimes I'm interested more in how is our work life, how is our life. And there has been a lot of changes. The fact that I'm addressing you like this is a testament of our change reality. Our planet, full of possibilities and wonders, home to 7.8 billion people. It took us 2 million years of human history to reach 1 billion and only 200 years to reach 7 billion. I cannot continue this presentation without mentioning the obvious. A fictitious scenario event 201 played out in New York City Conference Center before a panel of academics, government officials, and business leaders last October. Ryan Moorhart, a biosecurity specialist, was worried that world leaders were not taking the threat of a pandemic seriously enough. In the past months, the reality of the world changed dramatically and unexpectedly. We're first seeing circumstances we never thought possible. The unexpected, it's becoming the norm. COVID has had far-reaching consequences beyond the spread of the disease itself and efforts to quarantine it. Levels of stress, fatigue, exhaustion, and burnout are running high in large sectors of the population. The unprecedented efforts to contain it have resulted in changes of behavior and patterns that have affected our mental and emotional balance. Our sense of safety and security has been challenged and we feel isolated and sometimes adrift. Despair. The world economy has also changed and we all have been affected, but not in the same fashion. A generational wealth report published by Bloomberg, just very recent, draw from the Federal Reserve data and show that the richest 50 American individuals have as much money as half of the United States, or 165 million people. At the industry level, almost all companies have been affected. Some are even questioning the reason of existence and are running against time to evolve and adapt. Other companies that should have fared well or thrived during this time face challenges of their own. Supply chain, workforce, management, trade, security, and energy. We have seen so many different things. Our day-to-day -day change, there were closures, there still are disruption, lockdown, interrupted communication. What we gave for granted is no longer there. This highly interconnected world has gone from being complicated to being complex. It means that very small changes can cause disproportionate impact. 
and COVID was not a small change. A huge series of connected events with the potential for other hazards became evident, while their effect is still ongoing. Another, we haven't faced yet, but we will. And chances are, they will be amplified and accumulated as times go by. So what now? Expertise and efficiency won't suffice anymore because the system just keeps changing too fast. Traditional business practices or ideas won't be enough in this new era. And they probably weren't enough to begin with. This is based on the 2018 Fortune 500 CEOs where apparently being a white male named John was key to success. Coincidentally, of the 24 MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant winners in the same year, nine were women and none of the men were named John. That group, chosen by a committee for its creativity, diversity of thought, and promise for important future advances was more diverse than other groups in many ways. What skills, practices, strategies do we need to have for facing current and future challenges? That's the question, isn't it? How do we find that idea that will revolutionize our business or maybe just keep us afloat? How do we envision multiple possibilities for a new world? How can we bring a new perspective to the table? How do we listen to the other boys with different experiences? I love this photo. The first time I saw it, I was amazed. How do we transform our mental models to understand the deeper meaning and consequences beyond what we can perceive and believe as truth? How do we increase and nurture new networks, ideas, skills, and experiences? How do we foster high achieving, creative and innovative and resilient things? What is that makes some groups more successful and more productive than others? These questions and others have been explored by academia, public and private institutions, NGOs and governments alike. It is a major driver for recruitment, retention and development talent, from MIT, Harvard, Oxford, to Google, IBM, Medicines and Frontiers, all of them have invested a huge amount of resources into finding and applying best practices. Those articles were my favorite ones. One of the key elements that most highly successful teams have in common is diversity. Diversity comes in different sizes and shapes. Why are heterogeneous teams more successful than homogeneous teams? We enter the world hardwired to make social connection. The evidence is impressive. Within one hour of birth, a human infant will draw her head back to look into the eyes and faces of the person crazing at her. We like and trust people who are members of our own social group more than we like outsiders or strangers. This in-group effect is so powerful that even random assignment into small groups is sufficient 
to create a sense of solidarity. It is only natural that group members compare themselves to one another and in the presence of diversity, form in and out group distinctions. Group members also tend to favor and compare, or cooperate more with those similar to them while derogating and distrusting out group members. I trust you because you look like me, because I can predict what you're going to do. So at that moment, I can take a risk. If I don't see myself in you, then I cannot predict you. Then I cannot take risks. Then I'm distrustful. But these biases, which are associated with intergroup conflict, for communication and local cohesion, they were important at some point in time. But there is another side of the story. If you have a very heterogeneous group, regardless of their academic background, level of expertise and experience, an homogeneous group will tend to have redundant ideas. We have heard this concept again and again. Those are the echo chamber. And then we have a reduced perspective. We need to expand that perspective. We need to increase our area of understanding and influence. We need to be more open. In the late 1990s, a value in diversity perspective of hypothesis was developed. Difference can be source of insight. Several experiments pointed out that the heterogeneous groups solve problems more efficiently than homogeneous groups. This perspective evolved over the following decades into what became known as the value in diversity hypothesis stating that members of diverse groups bring unique perspectives, create a large pool of available information, skills, approaches, and networks. What it's better to understand through the eyes of other people, the world. Diversity call then produce constructive tasks and debate, causing team members to explore alternative solutions and conduct more analysis of the issues at hand. Such processes lead to more creativity, better decisions, and higher performance. This, well, actually there are several different graphics about what and how diversity comes, but I find this particular one very, very complete. It is based on four dimensions. In the inner more inner more circle is the personality, the I. External dimensions, internal dimensions, and organizational dimensions. In this study, we actually started most of the concepts around this session, the mix that matter, published by the Boston Consulting Group. In collaboration with the Technical University of Munich, they found that in complex companies, a significant positive relations exist between innovation and industry. Country of origin, career path, and gender. Even more, the, in the study shows that companies with the greatest gender diversity generated about 34% of their revenues for innovative products and services. That compares with innovation revenues of 25% from companies with the least gender diversity. The numbers were clear. The path was evident. We know what we have to do. The question is how. We all have been told that the way we have to get ahead is to 
to compete. Get into the right school, get into the right job, get to the top. If I'm successful, then I'm right, isn't it? I can scream louder. I can interrupt you. This is the way we have been doing it all along. It's my way or the highway. Why fix it if it's not broken? I can do it. You can do it too, obviously. But it is evident. It's simple. Why didn't you realize? Everybody thinks, except you. We are different. And it's okay. How different are we? Do we know that? Can we spot the difference? Do we have the language to name them? Do I have the language to name myself? Do I have the concept to define me? Who am I? What are my emotional triggers? In what circumstances do I try? What doesn't come naturally to me? What is my degree of introversion, openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, or neuroticism? If this is triggering or ringing a bell, this, is, this comes from the ocean personality test, which I totally recommend you to take. It will help you understand to get the language, to get the concepts, to see who you are, how you are, and maybe how you will react to the different circumstances you will face. But in this exploration of the world I, I need you. A you that is extra but is still physical enough. A you of a other human being close to me that I can see. The only way that I can understand who am I is by contrasting who you are. I will see myself more clearly because I see you. I can recognize and cherish our commonalities and difference. I can grow and learn. I can face the present and hope for a future when you can see me as well. And maybe with this new sense of solidarity, empathy, safety and trust, we can fight the ideas we desperately need. Because no idea is fully formed, it emerges a little bit as a child is born, kind of messy and confused, but full of possibility. And it's only through the general's contribution, faith and challenge that they achieve their potential. I encourage you to read the material of Margaret Heffernan when talking about social capital. We cannot fail. We need to do our best. The st stakes are too high. So my call for actions to you today is to remember that we are not the center of the universe. Not because I can do it means that you can do it. We know as a software developers that the worst thing that we can do is assume. Time and time again, we don't estimate correctly because we assume that you thought that I knew. We need to understand that both directions are important. We need to understand that we are different. And let me give you an insight of how different we are. 
our mental models, even in the most basic activities, like counting, are completely different. There's a story about Richard Feynman. He discovered in the most unusual way how he, when counting, had a mental representation of a tape changing. Well, a mathematician who was his friend during his years in university had a voice, an inner voice, counting. So while Richard Feynman could listen and repeat while still counting because the internal representation of the numbers were a visual one, his friend could read whatever he wanted and still repeat it after the count was done. And none of them could do the opposite thing. So this is exactly my point. Do not assume that you have the truth that also fits another person. Be open, be curious. And I'm not saying only be curious about the order, be curious about you, and you will notice that you need the order to understand yourself. The whole idea is be you, understand you, while understanding him of her. I do have a lot of material, but I don't want to tax you even more with this kind of concepts. Uh, even though I really believe that this is important. I really believe that diversity, it's important. And I didn't go in the typical way saying women in tech is totally missing or we don't have enough women in tech. That's obvious. But that's not the only diversity that we need to improve. And for me, the acceptance of the individuality of each of us will actually improve all diversities in all the industries, in all countries. So that's why I advocate for this, for understanding, for empathy, to create in each and one of us an ally. Because without that, we are not going to change. And believe me, we need to change. Change is around us, even if we don't want it. The other thing that is really important for me, it's feedback. How do I improve? How do I help me and others? So please scan the QR code that it should be in the, I don't know which side, but should be there. And provide me as much feedback as you want, need. I'm here. I will be still here. I do answer in Twitter, in many social media methods of communication. So thank you very much for your time. It has been a pleasure. Well, Ishel, that was a lot to unpack. Thank you so much for, again, bringing all these thoughts and insights. Um, I I have two kids and my wife and I recently realized this COVID thing for the very first time that we met enabled us to spend 365 days together every single day. So, <laughs> So I don't know how exactly this, my thought relates to everything that you said. I think it does because 
it's we learned so much from each other spending all of these days together and uh uh when we we bring this to work relationships and friends and family and everything it there is i think i think it i mean it was a bad thing that happened but we got to make the most of it right we got to think what could we learn positively from this experience even the simple one that is before we have casual encounters we were talking with people that we met in conferences or in the streets or whatever now if you want a meaningful interaction with somebody you have to call there has to be intention so yeah. just by changing that it's it's amazing the quality of the communications that i have now it's totally different not that yeah, it's i prefer that yeah. i mean it's it's great to eventually eventually coincidentally stumble upon somebody that you know or finally meet someone in person but um you know the usage of social media in general for keeping up with friends and family has been reducing over time and then this whole thing happened and now i do see at least on my circle of friends and family members i do see us communicating more often really over chat over video so so that's that's i think that's a very positive thing that happened and uh, i think everybody's realizing that uh, thank you so much for for joining us and sharing that. Um, I think there's a lot for people to learn, and uh, it, it's it was amazing. Thank you.